Welcome everyone to today's webinar on employment fraud and cybersecurity presented by our educational series sponsor, Shimon Canal Trust Company. Many thanks to our presenters, Allison DeVita and Brian Cornell for being with us today and all the participants who have joined in. Please note this webinar is being recorded to share what we learn with the business community. All participants will be provided a link of the recording as well. Allison and Brian will share their presentation with you then follow with time for questions and discussion. Please use the chat to submit any questions during the presentation. And just a reminder when others are speaking to please keep your audio on mute to minimize background noise. With that said, I'll turn things over to Allison. Great, thank you so much. Good morning and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm gonna speak just a little bit about unemployment fraud um, to start our presentation. COVID-19 gave us the conditions to create the perfect storm for unemployment fraud. As unemployment claims grew at an extremely fast pace, state departments of labor became very overwhelmed. All unemployment fraud is a direct result of identity theft. States have experienced a surge in fraudulent unemployment claims filed by organized crime rings using stolen identities that were accessed or purchased from past data breaches, the majority of which occurred in previous years and involved larger criminal efforts unrelated to unemployment. Criminals are now using these stolen identities to fraudulently collect benefits across multiple states. Um, Candace, I am on the um, third, there you go, thank you. My apologies. Um, Please understand that unemployment fraud is a national problem. It's happening in every state, not just here in New York. Earlier in the pandemic, unemployment fraud was primarily prevalent on the West Coast, but since last fall has really become a nationwide issue. New York State Department of Labor stated that they have identified more than 425,000 fraudulent unemployment claims since March of 2020 as of the end of February of 2021. Because the states are so overwhelmed with reports of fraudulent claims, the U.S. Department of Labor is trying to assist the states. In March, the U.S. Department of Labor launched a new website specifically for people to understand unemployment insurance identity theft and how and where to report stolen benefits if they are victims. Next slide, please. Is your employee a victim? For information and reporting types of unemployment fraud, including claimant fraud or employer fraud, please visit the Department of Labor's Report Unemployment Fraud page. Candace, I'm on the next slide. Thank you. Uh, back one. Thank you. My apologies again. Um, if you are an employer, please make sure that you're submitting the paperwork protesting the fraudulent unemployment claim and do that in a timely manner to help assist with identifying the fact that it's fraudulent. Um, after you have protested the unemployment claim, please provide your employees with the Department of Labor's website and the following tools and steps to help them through this. Many employees don't know what to do when they realize they're a victim. Shimon Canal has put together a list of the following steps to take that we provide to victims of unemployment fraud and identity theft so they know what to do. New York State Department of Labor is now using IDME's secure online tool to verify the identity of some unemployment insurance and pandemic unemployment assistance applicants. This new tool allows New Yorkers to safely and efficiently submit their identity documentation if required due to federal guidelines and or su suspected fraud. Please note, all IDME emails will come from the email address New York State Department of Labor at info.labor.ny.gov and text messages will come from 468 
3-11-311. ID Me is a trusted, secure service used by various federal and state government agencies. Next slide, thank you. The victims should then notify their financial institution's fraud department that they're a victim so that alerts can be placed on their financial institution accounts. The victim should also place a fraud alert with the three credit bureaus by contacting one of the following bureaus, and I've listed them there with both an email address and a phone number. Um, please note that you only need to notify one of the three credit bureaus because the credit bureaus share the information to make sure that everyone is protected equally. Then we suggest that the victims request a free credit report by going to annualcreditreport.com. Um, the reason that we do this is we want the victims to review the credit report for any unknown credit cards, loans, and other credit items that may have been taken out in their name. Um, if any items are identified as fraud, the victim should contact the companies to make them aware that they are a victim of identity theft. Um, one of the things that we do recommend is that if you have questions about the information on the report that you receive, please contact your financial institution and they should be able to help you review the information. Uh, next slide, please. After about six months, after you've been made aware that you're a victim, we do suggest that you request a second credit report. Um, the reason we give a period of time is what we've found is that if you're a victim, there's an initial hit, um, so to speak, as to people trying to take out credit in your name. Then there's a period of time where there's really no activity, and then we see another resurgence of people attempting to take out credit in your name. So we do suggest that after about a six month period that you do review your credit again. Another step that we've included is to request a free factor report from checksystems.com. Uh, the reason that we do this is the fraudsters may have opened fraudulent deposit accounts in your name without your knowledge at other financial institutions. Um, we have seen this as part of the evolving scheme. Um, the, only, the only drawback with the factor report is the only the banks that use check systems when someone opens an account report through the system. So it's not going to catch every account that may be opened fraudulently in your name at other financial institutions, but only at financial institutions that use check systems. But it's still definitely worth reviewing for fraudulent accounts. Additionally, the IRS is offering a six digit identity pin to help protect your identity when following your federal tax return. Um, we do suggest that everyone get their identity pin um, for being able to verify uh, that it's you when you are filing your taxes, particularly if you're a victim of identity theft. Um, I've also provided a bullet point out here that gives you the link to the IRS um, to help you obtain your identity protection PIN. Next slide. So one of the biggest questions that we get here is how did this happen? So if someone is a victim of unemployment fraud, it, it means their personal information at some point in time has been compromised. The primary information required to file an unemployment claim is your name, 
social security number, and date of birth. How did the information become compromised? Honestly, most likely from a previous breach, but it's unlikely to know specifically how and when the compromise occurred. Um, perfect timing for this presentation. Um, just one example, this week it was revealed that over 500 million Facebook users' personal information was found posted on a hacker's website. 32 million of the compromised users are users in the United States alone. This information that was posted to the hacker's website included individuals' full names, their email address, their location, their phone numbers, as well as biographical information. This information that was just posted to the hacker's website was information that was actually hacked from Facebook back in 2019. So the hackers actually sat on this information for two years before they chose to post it on a hacker's website. So that's one of the reasons why we're not able to tell people when their information or how their information was compromised. We, you know, we're seeing that, you know, the people obtain this information illegally and then they sit on it for a while. Uh, next slide. Next steps. Um, what should you really do? Well, we're suggesting that people just be vigilant. Um, just be aware of your incoming emails. Um, you know, don't fall for the telephone scams that, you know, asking you for your social security number or, you know, your social security number has been compromised, so please press one. Um, we also want you to be aware of phishing or social engineering attempts. You know, a lot of these hackers have your email addresses and are going to try to get you to turn over more information or your computer credentials through phishing or social engineering attempts. We also want people to change your passwords frequently and don't use your name or common words. Include numbers and special characters. Again, uh, do not use the same password for all of your logins. Routinely review your bank and investment accounts for any unusual activity. Talk to your institution, your financial institution, about adding security questions to your accounts. Uh, review and update your contact information with your financial institution. Um, and that's actually a real big one. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard if, if your financial institution is, is seeing some unusual or suspicious activity on your account and they try to reach out to you and, you know, you've changed your phone number and we're not able to get a hold of you. So, you know, please keep that information current. And also check your financial institution's website for an education center because just about every financial institution has identity theft, you know, preventative measures out there for you to look at and to go ahead, you know, and, and follow. You know, unfortunately, the information is out there. The best thing we can do now is to take steps to mitigate the damage. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will be sharing our identity theft handout with the chamber um, that you're free to use and hand out to any of your employees or even use yourself if you've recognized that they're a victim of identity theft. Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Allison. So I want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Brian Cornell. I am a colleague of Allison's at Shimon Canal Trust Company. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer here. I have over 20 years of IT and security experience. And what we're seeing today is unlike nothing we have seen in the past, nothing to this type of scale, scope and magnitude of malicious activity. I'm trying, there we go. 
cybersecurity risks, these security threats, they're nothing new. They, they've been around for decades. However, with the beginning of the pandemic, businesses, schools, most organizations, they had to adopt and embrace remote and online methods for doing business. This has created a change in landscape for approximately a year. The world did not have a choice. Businesses needed to operate, schools needed to function, banks needed to shift to more online banking as customers and people were not able to leave their houses. With this in mind, in the change in landscape, many online portals have been quickly introduced and implemented to provide you with the dissemination of important information. As examples, someone wants to know their vaccine status. Somebody wants to know the status of their stimulus check. Has it been deposited in their bank? Many people went on unemployment. What's the status of my unemployment? Has it been approved? What do I need to send them to get it approved? Have my checks started coming into my account? The quickness and the rapid introduction of these online portals have gone without proper training, awareness, or even the sharing of best security practices being part of the rollout. Many people remain uneducated in security and they're very prone, even though technology is now at the forefront of their everyday life. The world is and continues to be in a very vulnerable position. I wish that hackers and people with malicious intent had you know, good insights and good values, but unfortunately they don't. They prey on vulnerability and weakness. And this type of activity is significantly increasing the number of attacks that we see every day and also the types of attacks within the world. Fraud, identity theft, and malicious activity in general are on the rise. Hackers are no longer and solely going after a company's infrastructure in their server environment environments to create harm. They're now targeting you. They're targeting individuals as well as entire organizations. And it's forcing each and every one of us to be on guard and to be on the lookout. With the vulnerability increasing, we're tempted to fall victim to well-crafted and well-tailored attacks that tempt us into dropping our guards, dropping our defense, and ignoring you know, basic common, common sense. A hacker is spending time targeting you they're doing their homework, they're researching you, they're finding out where you work, they're finding out who your colleagues are, and this is all done through social media. Think about what information you have out there on LinkedIn or Facebook. What could a hacker use that they learn from you, public information that you provide to actually target you? They could find out who your family members are, who your friends are, they could send emails being one of those people to you just to get you lured in to fall on victim to one of these attacks. The attacks are brutal and they are relentless. Antivirus was what we all needed years ago, but that alone does not protect you anymore. Hackers are now using a multitude of methods to target and exploit us. Some examples of these, I mentioned vaccine status and updates, unemployment status, stimulus payment schemes, and even phone calls. Phone calls aren't just getting us to sign up for something. Now they're tricking us into providing information um, through tempting us to fall for their schemes. These new tactics fall into the term security experts call social engineering. The hackers take advantage of a situation or a crisis, which we are in, where we've all dropped our guards out of curiosity, curiosity, desperation, or need. 
who doesn't want to quickly find out if their stimulus check was deposited? When you need money, who, who doesn't want to quickly find out if your unemployment claim went in and was processed? Phishing and smishing are two tactics I'm going to cover to show you how to identify and protect yourself. Knowledge is key in combating these attacks. We've heard of phishing. Phishing is a way to mock or disguise different types of correspondence to trick you into believing it is a real and legitimate communication. That's it. We regularly receive emails, but emails that fake who they are in order to get you to follow a link where you enter valuable and personal information provides hackers with a way to steal your account info, get your credit card number, get your social security number, your passwords, and a whole bunch more information. Once they get this information, they can do harm to you, but they can also continue on their social engineering schemes and then target other people you know. Here's an example of a phishing email. If you look, out, look this over, it seems to come from SunTrust, which is a bank, large bank, financial institution. A quick glance would have a victim believe this is legit, and they may mistakenly follow the link and enter information believe that believe in the email and the link are real. As you see, to view your account, visit suntrust.com. Well, that looks legit. Upon careful inspection, you can discover and I can, I'm going to show you a way to find out if that link is real or not. Other phishing attacks act as if they're someone else you know and trust in order to get you to follow a link and enter valuable information. In this example, the message seems to come from the CEO who doesn't want to be responsive to the CEO or your supervisor. Once they get your information, they can launch a multitude of attacks in order to gain a higher level of unauthorized information and continue spreading harm. Smishing, it's very similar to phishing, but instead of using email, it lures a victim into providing information through text messages. They lure you to follow a link where you fill out an online form, which is phony, but it collects information about you and you don't even know what's happening. Or how about you get a free prize? All you have to do is sign up for this. Well, the prize is not gonna come, but they're gonna take your information because you're voluntarily giving it to them. How do we counter malicious activity? What can we do? How do we protect ourselves? There's many, many tips out there. There's many, many best practices. There's a lot of education out there. I suggest that everybody learn as much as they can. Follow good security practices. Ask for help in identifying these scams. Someone in your family may be able to help you if it's of a personal nature. At work, you may have an IT department or a security department where you can reach out and say, Hey, Brian, is this message, is this email real? Is it legit? Can you check it out for me? Avoid clicking links that are inside an email. So if you get a link from Shimon Canal Trust Company saying click here, why not just open up the internet, a new browser and type in the site you know? Your target order is ready, click the link. We'll go to target, log into your account, do it directly to avoid falling for something that's fake. Another thing, very important, change your password frequently. Make your password complex. Don't use common names or phrases. Put numbers and special characters, exclamation, quotations within your password. And never send passwords through email. If you fall victim to one of these schemes, Something like ransomware could affect you, yourself or your business. A hacker can gain your information. They can also install malicious software 
into the network or on your system. What ransomware will do is they'll get on as you and they'll encrypt. Imagine your company's entire financial folder encrypted and the hacker has the keys to the folder, but no one else does. Now they can demand a ransom. I will give you the keys if you pay me X amount of dollars. So you either lose the information forever and never get it, or you pay the ransom. Millions of dollars have been paid out by companies to recover their data that a hacker has accessed and encrypted through ransomware. Some, some more tips to help you. How do we alert ourselves to a phishing scam? Again, one important tactic you can try, and I stress this, get into the habit of going directly to the sites you know versus following a link. It's easy to go to the internet and type in Shimon County Chamber of Commerce's website address versus following the link within the email. Look for poor grammar, misspelled words. Look for the generic greetings. Dear ma'am, dear sir. So back to our email that we were looking at, our phishing email. They want you to follow the link to verify your account details. So many people will fall victim to this and they'll click on that link and it'll bring you up to a page that looks just like your, your page you go to regularly, whether it be your bank, whether it be your Facebook account, um, whether it be your fantasy football account through NFL or ESPN or Yahoo, and it'll look exactly the same and you'll have no idea that you're being fooled. But you can check by using a mouse hover. And what I mean by mouse hover is in this example, if you hover your mouse over the link, verify account details, you're gonna see the real site that you're gonna be directed to pop up in a little window. Now, I don't know what this audit-optics.com is and all this other stuff, but this doesn't look legit to me. So therefore, I'm gonna avoid clicking this link. Instead, let's say this email came from your financial institution, your bank, I'm gonna open up the internet and again, I'm gonna type in the address I know to get into my account. Ensure your organization has security policies. Understand these policies, follow them. Keep your antivirus up to date. Keep in mind, security is everyone's responsibility. It's not just the IT department's responsibility alone anymore. That's a thing of the past. It's a whole community that really has to have a security conscious culture to protect yourself through all aspects of hacking and malicious activity. Together with your knowledge and your awareness and you practice and best practices, we can keep our environment safer than without that. Again, knowledge is key. Take your time. Don't rush through things. Don't rush through emails and just kind of have a security conscious in general and overall, overall, and it'll go a long way to keeping everybody safe. Okay, with that, I can turn this back over to Candace. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Allison. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask that now, or you can use the chat to submit.
Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> Alan just submitted to the chat and said it was very helpful and says thank you. We can give it another minute here, see if anyone has anything coming through the chat. Otherwise, if there's not anything else that either of you have to add, we can wrap things up a little early. Candace, this is Allison. And I think the only thing that I would add is, you know, when people receive a phone call that, that they're a victim, um they react very very quickly and very nervously um we just want people to take a step back um you know if you're left a voicemail on your answering machine maybe don't call that number back google you know your your financial institution's phone number if you you know if you don't have it handy um see what the phone number is, call the actual contact center, and then ask to be transferred to the individual who left you the message, um, just to verify that, you know, it is actually a representative from the financial institution that is reaching out to you. Uh, because we have seen um, where fraudsters perpetrate someone, you know, from the bank and you know, it wasn't really the bank that reached out to the individuals. So, you know, take a breath when you receive notification because it, it may be legitimate, it may not. So just take a breath and, and just make sure that you know who you're reaching out to before you do so and start providing them with additional information that they may not have. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, and another thing I, I would like to mention with the scams, um, you can also submit any, any information that you receive related to scams to the Better Business Bureau. You can go right to their website, bbb.org, and you can fill out everything of, of what had happened what type of scam it was and just provide as much information as possible because they do like to track those things as well so they can try and prevent them. Yeah, Candace, and if you don't mind, I'll add to this. This is Brian. I, I did see one chat. It seems to have come from Catherine saying, you know, you're going through this unemployment fraud issue yourself. Um, my wife also is going through this herself and but it's from the unemployment office in kentucky the state of kentucky and she gets the automated calls you know normally about 11 o'clock at night and she can't reach a, a person directly and i'm going to tell you that there is so much fraud going on in the world and in our country that these offices are extremely overwhelmed so if you feel like you're not getting any help it's, it's just because they don't have the resources to assist you in a timely manner. That's the danger I was talking about with all these new online platforms out there to disseminate information and provide valuable resources to you. Yes, it's helpful, but it also provided an opportunity for hackers to impersonate people and actually file false claims. I'll tell you how easy it is, and this is a real example of unemployment fraud or fraud in general. And it did not happen at Shimon Canal Trust Company. So let's say I work for the Chamber of Commerce and Candace is my human resources manager. Well, I have a, I have a Chamber of Commerce email, but I quickly go and I create a Brian Cornell email through Google or Hotmail doesn't even matter what it is. It could be called hacker at hotmail.com, but my name is Brian Cornell. I send an email to Candace, my human resources manager, saying, hey, this is Brian. Can you send me the direct deposit change form? Well, Candace being, you know, really busy, it's gonna see that the email came from me, Brian Cornell, 
and she's going to say, hey, here you go, Brian, and she sends me the direct deposit form. I fill it out with a, a real but fake bank account. I send it back to her and Candace processes it. Next time, thing you know, the real Brian Cornell goes to Candace saying, how come I didn't get paid? Well, it's because you changed your account on direct deposit. That's how easy this can happen. And that takes no skill whatsoever. But what Candace could have done is tried to verify my, who she was replying back to. Just because it said Brian Cornell, it's the same thing. Just because the CEO is inviting you to a Zoom meeting does not mean that's who it really is. And that type of information should never be emailed back and forth without being encrypted or secure. And most institutions, human resources department do know that. So it's very scary out there um, and everybody is overwhelmed across the board. And so when everyone's overwhelmed, they don't have the resources, people fall victim to these very tempting and deceiving schemes. Thank you, Brian. Doesn't look like anything else is coming into the chat so far. Um, just we did have a question in here about the presentation, which I will send the link of the recording after that uploads along with the presentation itself and any other information that Allison or Brian would like to share with you all. Yeah, I'll say one more thing. I, I'm reading um, Catherine's uh, message a little more. It, it is very unsettling and you feel helpless. You're following the guidelines, you're following the protocols, you're not getting help, you're worried. You can't force it to go any faster, unfortunately. You can try, you're only gonna end up pulling your hair out. However, what you need to do, if you have not done it already, is change all of your passwords from every account you have, make them complex, and continue to monitor all of your banking activity from, you know, whether it's one bank or multiple banks. Follow the links in the presentation that Allison, Allison talked about. Run some credit checks. Make sure there's nothing going on as far as identity theft, because it may not just be unemployment fraud alone. You may be victim of other activity. So be proactive as far as monitoring your accounts, changing your passwords, and doing things like that to help only, only to keep it scaled down to the unemployment fraud that you have versus anything else that could affect you even worse than unemployment fraud. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so I don't see anything else coming in through the chat. If anyone does have any questions afterwards, I know it's a lot to take in at once, feel free to shoot your questions over to me and I can connect you with Brian and or Allison um, and I can include their contact information on the follow-up email with the link to the recording if anyone has any questions for them. With that said, I'll just say thank you again to Allison and Brian and everyone for joining us. Um, lastly, I'd just like to mention if anyone is interested in chamber membership that's not already a member, you can contact the chamber at info at shemungchamber.org or give us a call at 607-734-5137. Thank you.